Walters Kluwer, involving CIAs, compliance experts, IROs, monitors, and certification. I'm Beth Kolodny, National Sales Manager, and also joining me from Walters Kluwer is Lynn Reinheimer, Manager of the ComplyTrack Subject Matter Experts and Sales Engineers. Before we begin today's webinar and introduce our featured speakers, I just want to cover a few quick housekeeping items. All lines have been placed on mute, so in order to submit questions, please use the Q&A menu bar located on the right side of your screen on the GoToWebinar toolbar. To download a copy of today's presentation, select Handouts on the GoToWebinar toolbar and follow the instructions or use the URL that was sent out in the reminder email this morning. Today's webinar has been approved, been approved for one CEU credit from the HCCA and an email with a survey and download instructions will be sent within one to two days of the, of the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce today's special featured speech speakers. First, I'd like to introduce Dick Husero. Dick was a special agent and supervisor for the FBI. He was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to serve as Inspector General for the largest IG office in government, the Department of Health and Human Services. He served as Inspector General for 12 years, during which many health care fraud and abuse-related initiatives were established. Upon leaving government in 1992, Dick established Strategic Management Services a consulting firm that focuses exclusively on healthcare organization compliance and regulatory issues. Dick writes and participates in professional meetings extensively addressing trends and solutions in healthcare compliance. We also have a Tom Herman. Tom served in the OIG Counsel's Office for 20 years. He was chief of the Administrative Litigation Office in the IG Counsel's Office. He handled the litigation of civil money penalty and exclusion cases on behalf of the OIG. Worked closely with DOG and CMS on the negotiation and settlement of global health care fraud and abuse cases. And in 2002, Tom was appointed to serve as the administrative appeals judge on the Health and Human Services Medicare Appeals Council. It was a six-year term. Tom joined Strategic Management Services in 2009. And now I'd like to take the time to turn this over to Dick. Mr. Cusero? Thank you, Beth. Let me just uh, say for the purpose of this uh, presentation, um, Tom and I not only spent a, no a great number of years uh, inside the OIG, and Tom actually was responsible for uh, doing the corporate integrity agreements on behalf of the OIG for a number of years, but also um, the fact is, is that for uh, many years subsequent, we have actually been involved in dozens of uh, uh, CIAs and IRO and uh, and the compliance expert engagements um, as consultants. So we, we see we've seen both sides of the um, of the coin, and hopefully we can um, impart today some of the uh, knowledge and experience that we have had, have had uh, in relationship to the subject. Notice that the agenda uh, is going to talk about the fact that there are evolving CIAs. Basically, I think we say evolving. The point that we're going to try to leave uh, today is the fact that. Uh, uh, compliance is evolving. It's evolving not only with CIAs, but it's also involving in compliance guidance expectations, and it's also evolving in terms of the number of people that are getting involved and contributing to expectations for compliance. Uh, and if you read both sides, and if you look at uh, what uh, the OIG and the Department of Justice and others are, are saying about what should be in uh, compliance programs, and then you see when the when the government has an opportunity to mandate what they think a compliance program should include, you begin to see the direction that uh, the government is going with regards to uh, compliance programs. So in this case, we're talking about the evolving corporate integrity agreements. The three areas that follow are the areas that seem to be evolving the most and are most significant in changes in recent years, including the, the level of board responsibilities under CIAs, as well as the mandates now for outside experts to be called in to oversee uh, compliance program. And then, of course, uh, you have uh, other uh, experts such as the IROs and so forth. We want to talk a little bit about that. And then also this whole area of certifications. More and more certifications are being added to CIAs, which are making it um, uh, a lot more interesting for people that have to live under these agreements. So the first part is an overview of the corporate um, integrity agreements. I want to talk about the purpose and character, the number and types, standard provisions, and evolving terms and conditions. 
this slide here is trying to give a, um, uh, an idea as to what uh, CIs look like in terms of where they're being um, required in various sectors. A lot of times people see in the media, uh, both the, um, uh, the popular print media as well as in trade sheets, the impression that uh, all of the CIAs are probably concentrated with pharmas and, and hospitals. But then if you look at this chart, what you'll see is that 40% of all the CIAs really involve individual small group practices. Uh, then, you, of course, you see hospitals coming in after that. And you get pharma, but pharma is only 7%. And then after that, you can see it really splits up a lot. You got rehab facilities, ambulance services, clinical labs, hospice and home health agency, and skilled nursing facilities. And notice the smallest component really is that Medicare choice or managed care plans. So at any rate, you can see that there's quite a distribution of types of uh, CIAs. But again, seeing how that they're uh, being uh, implemented by uh, healthcare sectors, I think it's, uh, it will be useful depending upon where it is that you sit in the healthcare industry. The uh, Office Inspector General has been doing a lot of work in this area. Tom, do you want to pick up on that and talk a little bit yeah, about Yeah, well, just by way of background, I mean, you're hearing, you're going to hear throughout this presentation uh, discussions of the OIG, Office of Inspector General, within HHS. And by way of background, um, it, it was started uh, formed in 1976. It is the oldest IG in government and the largest. And typically its resources or the largest percentage of them have been focused on Medicare and Medicaid. Um, in dealing and in working with the OIG, it's important to understand the various offices and components. Uh, you have the Office of Investigations, which, which is charged with conducting investigations and working closely with both the Department of Justice and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. You have the Office of Audit Services, which is responsible for conducting retrospective audits of recipients of HHS funds. You have the Office of Evaluations and Inspections, which is in effect an in-house think tank. It conducts evaluations and reviews of HHS activities and programs. You have the Office of Counsel, which is a large staff of attorneys and paralegals, probably the largest um, within any OIG's office. Uh, and they are involved in a variety of activities, such as representing the OIG in administrative sanction cases affirmatively, uh, negotiating global settlements with, uh, on behalf of OIG, monitoring CIAs, uh, and then providing general legal counsel to investigators, auditors, and evaluators. And then finally, you have the Office of Public Affairs, which I just want to bring to your attention, uh, and it maintains a very robust website and daily postings of significant government enforcement activities and settlements. Uh, and I encourage you to uh, sign up for their listserv, which um, comes up virtually daily with new information. Uh, and all the corporate integrity agreements, or CIAs, that we will be discussing, um, which are current, will be or are available on the OIG's website. So you can certainly uh, refer to it if you're seeking to see specific terms. Okay, now we move to Corporate Integrity Agreements Generally, or CIAs. Uh, this has evolved over the years, as Dick mentioned, as part of the federal government's global settlement of a health care fraud or abuse case. Um, the OIG, typically through the counsel's office, negotiates with a subject health care company, provider, or practitioner of the specific terms of the CIA. The CIA is entered into by the subject of the enforcement action in lieu of being excluded from participation in federal health care programs. And to ensure that moving forward a health care organization meets all federal health care program requirements and doesn't pose a continued risk to either the programs or beneficiaries, the OIG requires that the organization enter into a CIA. Uh, usually a CIA is for a five-year period and it obligates the signing health care entity to meet very specific compliance obligations. The OIG's counsel's office has the responsibility for both negotiating on the front end as well as monitoring an organization's compliance over the five-year period of the CIA. Um, as Dick referenced in the chart earlier, there are today approximately 345 uh, CIAs or integrity agreements, which is what uh, is used for individual practitioners in effect. Most of these agreements include standard provisions related to the establishment and maintenance of a compliance program. These include written compliance policies and procedures, compliance training, and sanction screening. 
There are also case-specific requirements that address the risk areas at issue, such as false claims, poor quality of care, improper arrangements with potential referral sources, and marketing techniques and activities. The CIA focuses on the risk area that was the subject of the federal enforcement action and requires that the healthcare entity institute certain controls to prevent recurrence of the improper conduct. To summarize, the CIAs almost always have the standard provisions focused on the overall compliance of the organization and then case-specific requirements focused on the specific improper conduct that was at issue in a case. Next is parties to a CIA. Typically, the entity or individuals that were the defendants in either a federal, criminal, or civil action and those that are entering into a global settlement with the U.S. government are the parties to a CIA with the OIG. This may be the pharmaceutical or device manufacturer, a health care system or hospital, long-term care facility, hospice, home health agency or supplier, or responsible individuals within the company. When the individual practitioner is subject to the CIA, as I mentioned earlier, an integrity agreement, which is usually less uh, specific, is entered into. These integrity agreements can either run five years or, in certain cases, three years. Uh, moving to your next slide, uh, standard CIA uh, provisions include, first, that the organization either establish or enhance its current compliance program. Secondly, that there be a compliance officer that is specifically designated. Third, that there is a prohibition on employing or contracting with an excluded entity or individual. Next, that there is notification to the OIG of any investigations or legal actions. Next, that there is a reporting and repayment of overpayments. And finally, that there is an, a prompt disclosure of any what is defined as reportable events. In addition, the organization is required to file an implementation report on its status of compliance and implementation within either 90 or 120 days, and then an annual report to the OIG uh, detailing its compliance activities over the past year. Okay. Let me pick up on the uh, next slide. Uh, one of the things that we've observed um, over the years is that uh, there is such attention placed upon negotiating a settlement um, with the OIG that there has probably been given an inadequate attention to what the consequences of living out of the CIA is going to be all about. Uh, therefore, once a CIA is signed, the first thing you need to do is be sure that you're taking active steps to meet the CIA obligations and keep in mind that there are deadlines. And these deadlines for many people are very, very difficult to keep and some of them find that they're really rushing to try to um, meet uh, the deadlines. And that includes searching for a qualified independent review organization. Uh, quite frankly, while you're negotiating a CIA, you should, be, you should have been doing this already, but few do this. Because you want to be sure that you have somebody that is, is qualified to do the work and that they can do it in a, in a timely and efficient and economical fashion. Then, and now the CIAs are also increasingly adding the need to have the boards engage uh, a qualified compliance expert. Now, what that means to differentiate that from the IRO is the compliance expert is to look at the compliance program itself, whereas the IRO is be looking at the substantive issues that uh, gave rise to the original action that led to the CIA. Also, there has to be steps taken to enhance the compliance program to meet the CIA standards set forth in the CIA. Again, these are things that if you're heading to our CIA, you should have been working on, but on, we have seen frequently that, that inadequate attention has been given to that area. It's basically the attorneys negotiating the settlement, and then after the settlement goes into place and everybody's scrambling to figure out how they could live under it. And then also you're going to have to find the, uh, engage an expert. You're going to have to find that expert who can, who can, might be able to help you. This is not mandated, but this is a good, good practice. Have somebody do a mock review to see what you're going to look like rather than run the risk of having an IRO or a compliance expert come in and find that you have uh, uh, systems failures or you have error rates that are too high going to, that are going to expand the obligations under the CIA or they find the compliance program is inadequate. All these things are very unhappy consequences when this occurs. So you want to think about having somebody do a mock review in advance that make sure that you're ready to take on having an independent party come in that will do a report that will go to the OIG. That also means that when you do a mock review or you do anything that's in preparatory to 
having the experts look at your operation under a CIA that you take immediate corrective actions on identified deficiencies. There are, uh, as we mentioned, a, uh, a number of evolving CIA provisions. One of the things that really is clear that the OIG is increasing a desire to have a better oversight and accountability under CIAs. What that means is they're adding a lot more requirements for executives and then board members. There are more certification by boards, more certification by CEOs, more certified by program managers, and more certification by compliance officers. Also, it is now common to have a CIA include the mandate that a board will hire a compliance expert to assist in compliance program review. We're going to be talking more about what this means. This is not, this is not a, um, uh, a small thing because when you have that board having to certify, you'll be see what that certification statement is. They better have somebody that does a good job for them and that they better have a program that they can attest to as meeting the CIA standards. There's also an increased focus on effectiveness of the compliance program. Not just that they're, you paint by the numbers, how many hotline complaints do you have, and how many uh, people have been trained, and all those kinds of things, but really want to know, as a result of all that, or you have less likelihood of an unwanted event or act from giving rise to a liability. Also, there's an expanding role of the independent review organizations, which is also evolving, which is something that needs to be taken into consideration. Now, looking at the specific uh, mandates within the CIA, um, almost always there is a requirement that uh, an organization have in place a compliance program containing the seven specified elements as set forth in the U.S. Sentencing Guidelines, OIG's program guidance, and more recently referenced in the Affordable Care Act. This includes, first, the infrastructure for a compliance program, including a compliance committee and compliance officer. Second, the development and distribution to all what is defined as covered persons in the CIA of a code of conduct. Third, written policies and procedures relating to the compliance program. Fourth, an initial and annual compliance training. Fifth, a hotline to receive complaints anonymously or confidentially. Next, sanction screening, auditing and monitoring procedures and processes, and finally, a process for identifying and following up on deficiencies uh, with remedial actions. Um, in addition, as uh, Dick referenced, uh, the retention of an outside organization, whether it be an IRO or a compliance expert, uh, or in certain rare situations, a compliance monitor is also mandated. But one of the things that you know, I would just interject here uh, is that um, uh, one of the points that the OIG is really serious about, and that is, and when you're doing all these things, that if you encounter a problem, a problem that rises to the level of what the OIG says it needs to be disclosed, you have to disclose that. And failing to disclose something that's material when you're under a CIA can really um, uh, cause you a lot of heartburn. All right, let me highlight um, a particular uh, focal point uh, of the OIG in recent years. Uh, and for a number of years, the OIG has, has adopted and embraced the Responsible Corporate Officer Doctrine. This is the view that a board of directors, as well as key executive staff, including the compliance officer, are responsible for a healthcare organization's operations and activities. Thus, it is incumbent on the board and executive team to exercise proper oversight and receive regular reports regarding compliance um, of an organization's operations. The OIG has collaborated with the American Health Lawyers Association as well as other professional groups in recent years to issue guidance on this issue. Um, about a year ago, um, they issued the Practical Guidance for Healthcare Governing Boards on Compliance Oversight. Um, and this slide shows various publications of the OIG and related uh, professional groups. Uh, all of these are available on the OIG's website. Let me just add, though, that the point that I had made earlier, and that is, is that uh, the OIG telegraphs their concerns, their interests, and what their expectations are with regards to compliance programs. If you look at these four documents, you will see that there's a trail there that goes over a decade that talks about this subject. And then all of a sudden now, what you're going to be seeing, we'll be t and Tom and I will be talking about it a little bit later, is they now are appearing in the corporate integrity agreement. So they're saying, this is what we expect. And then when and they, they talk about it, and over time, then they, they harden it up, and then they then they, they hardwire it into the CIAs. So this is a good 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 look at these documents and see 
the current thinking of the OIG, but the thinking of the OIG years ago, and then see, based upon what we're going to be talking about today, how that gets applied into CIAs. And speaking of communicating uh, the OIG's message, uh, the current Inspector General, Dave, uh, Daniel Levinson, at various public forums in recent years, has continued to articulate the proposition that a healthcare organization's board has the fiduciary duty and responsibility to assess on a regular basis an organization's compliance with federal and state requirements. He has stated, and I quote, board involvement and commitment is critical for a successful compliance program top down. The best boards are active, questioning, even skeptical. Boards should receive candid, timely, and comprehensive information on how an organization's compliance program is operating. And boards shouldn't make assumptions or view their job narrowly or shy away from tough questions. We will move to uh, board responsibilities, but um, let's let's stop for a moment and just think about um, what Levinson has said and when uh, and some of the other and some of the other documents that they have been published. And really, what you're seeing is that the OIG now recognizes and has recognized for a number of years that a driver for improvement in compliance program needs to be from the top and from the boards. Nothing is in isolation from anything else. For example, when Sarbanes Oxley came into being, what Surveys actually focused on was board responsibilities and board compliance oversight. And Surveys actually was for financial reasons, but all of a sudden you start having boards and publicly traded companies suddenly take a much larger role in oversight of compliance. Many of those board members move also moved also to the healthcare sector, either for the few companies that are publicly traded, but quite often to companies that were not or entities that were not publicly traded, and they began to say start asking questions about compliance in a way that had never happened before. What we're now seeing is that coming back to the OIG, the OIG and Department of Justice have been picking up on this theme, and now we're beginning to see more and more direction toward the fiduciary and uh, other obligation duties that, uh, that uh, boards have to have if they, if they are going to be providing oversight and then holding them personally responsible for that. For example, one of the things that they have uh, begun to really focus on is that Boards must have training. The members must undergo at least two hours of training annually and relating to compliance and, and what's going on in their healthcare sector, regulatory-wise and, and legally. They have responsibility for meeting a CIA requirements because the CIA makes it very clear that they cannot sit on the sideline. They must be actively involved in it. They have been signed responsibility for the compliance program in ways in which you'll see coming out that is really strict, very uh, severe. They have responsibility for risk assessments conducting and uh, conducting oversight on how they're being done. Members are certified to receiving this required training and the certification shall specify training received and the date and copies of the certification and course materials shall be retained. This is the first time we're really introducing now board certification. We'll be talking more about that uh, shortly. Now, board mandates. Uh, it does, this goes back, um, uh, uh, again, to Sarbanes-Oxley. It's not as strict as Sarbanes-Oxley, but what they said, you must have at least one independent member. And quite frankly, uh, it, the best practice is you should have somebody who is compliance literate, which means that they, un they understand compliance issues, that they've been a compliance officer or they have been a consultant that, or in a, a law firm that, uh, that has worked in evaluating compliance programs, but they have an understanding of what a, a good compliance program is and what it takes to make a good compliance program. Board mandates also that they must review and have oversight of compliance uh, with, their, with their organization with applicable laws and regulations. They have to, and they must ensure that all the CIA mandates and requirements are being met. They must lead a, at least quarterly to review and oversee the compliance program. Again, think of these in terms of the fact that you do not have a CIA you have, and you're a compliance officer someplace. These are the uh, points that the, that the OIG is stressing and mandating when they have the authority to mandate it. And, but they're also support and voluntary compliance programs, the same thing. But, so these are good lessons to remember. They must meet even an executive session with the compliance officer to make sure that they're getting a full and truthful uh, information that's not going to be um, uh, basically compromised by having executive officers hearing what they say. They have to review the uh, Compliance Officer and Compliance Committee performance, what they mean by Compliance Committee, that's the Executive or the Management Compliance Committee. They've got to report to the OIG on steps taken under the CIA to improve compliance, inform the OIG of, doc of documents and other materials that they have reviewed, 
Retain a compliance expert. We'll talk more about this, what this means, to review and to assist them in their obligation to review the compliance program. And the compliance officer is going to have to prepare a report with finding and recommendations. They will, uh, then the um, board has to review that report. But the big thing is that report then becomes included in the end report to the OIG. So all of a sudden you're going to have an outside expert, independent expert, filing a report, going through the compliance, or going through the, uh, the um, board to the OIG, and if there's problems with that report, the, the organization and particularly the board better be prepared to answer it. They have to prepare and maintain minutes of meetings with a compliance expert, and then they have to certify that they are meeting their mandated obligations. Outside experts. There are really three kinds that, that, that the OIG has referred to in their CIAs. There's the independent review organization, as Tom pointed out, they really focus on the substantive side of the um, uh, CIA in terms of the issues that led to uh, the government intervention and finally to the corporate integrity agreement. The compliance experts, which I just alluded to, that must be um, hired by boards. And then in some cases, compliance monitors. Now, this, this is a term that gets confused because it's used several different places. Department of Justice uses the term compliance monitors. The OIG has monitors that, uh, that are overseeing the compliance program, but what we're referring to here is there on occasion, the OIG may feel that the work of uh, the IRO or other people that were supposed to be giving oversight is not up to standard. They, they may then feel the need to intervene directly, and they will appoint somebody to do it. Now, whereas the independent review organization and the compliance experts are selected by the entity to do the work subject to the approval or disapproval of the OIG, the compliance monitors are picked by the OIG. Now, in the practical guidance on, uh, on experts, this is something that uh, the, one of the publications that uh, Tom alluded to earlier the OIG has uh, placed emphasis on board responsibility and oversight of compliance program uh, operations. Uh, if you read this uh, practical guidance for healthcare governing boards on compliance, you will actually see language that's for all practical purposes identical to what's appearing in CIAs today. The OIG view on uh, board engagements of an independent compliance expert to assist in fulfilling compliance responsibility has been growing uh, for a long time. And they've been telegraphing that they believe this should be the case. And now what they're doing is in the CIAs, they're mandating it. They also, uh, the, uh, uh, the OIG uh, mandate in recent CIAs is that, that, that the boards must engage such an independent uh, expert to assist them in meeting their obligations. Now this slide just shows what Dick has already discussed with you, which is uh, summary of the type of outside organizations or experts that the OIG um, requires in various CIAs, either an IRO, um, an independent monitor, which is typically related to quality of care, and, and or a compliance expert. Um, now moving first to the IRO, um, the OIG requires that such an org outside organization annually assess compliance with the identified risk area. This might be reviewing claims for health care program payment, arrangements with potential referral sources, or marketing activities. The early CIAs negotiated by the OIG initially required the IRO to review both operational areas that were at risk as well as the compliance program. However, in recent years, the IRO reviews have been focused on the risk area that was the subject of the government's original enforcement action. Let me just interject that. that um when they said that initially they had both, what we're seeing now is the OIG, when they when they dropped having compliance program reviews as part of the IRO responsibilities, they realized that that created a gap, and that, of course, is leading up to the discussion that we're having with regards to having a compliance expert coming in. So now you're going to, instead of having one uh, independent party like an IRO do everything, now they got two. Um, now, with respect to the IRO claims reviews, the OIG has required in recent CIAs either the IRO's annual review of a random sample of claims, such as 100 claims, or quarterly reviews of a smaller sample of claims. IROs have also been required to annually assess a company's systems and transactions with potential referral sources to determine whether adequate controls exist. 
and in some instances, a pharmaceutical company or managed care organization's marketing practices have been subject to IRO review. Um, some of you may have attended the recent H HCCA annual meeting uh, two months ago, and if you attended sessions addressing OIG enforcement activities, you probably heard discussions focused on the selection of an IRO as well as their reviews. It was also suggested at uh, these sessions that the reviews conducted by an IRO in some cases are e either substandard or not in accordance with the terms of the CIA. Interestingly, and I draw to your attention, last week the Reuters News Service published an article which was captioned, quote, independence of compliance reviews is questioned in drug firm settlements, end quote. The article focused on the fact that several large pharma firms have their operational audit firms also serving as their IRO, and questions were raised as to whether this was compliant with the GAGAS standards regarding independence and objectivity. It should be noted that an IRO is required to conduct its reviews in accordance with standards for program or operational reviews as established by the General Government Accountability Office in their GAGAS or generally accepted government auditing standards. Um, now moving forward uh, to compliance monitors, as I already noted, uh, in certain quality of care cases. Let me go back down, just yep. so, just sure. so that, that it, what you said is, is important because I'll tell you one thing is that I haven't been the Inspector General, I'll tell you that when something critical, like criticizing the way that is of the OIG, I, can, you, I think that you can probably think that uh, that selection of uh, IROs in the future, they're going to be more focused on independence and qualification than they have in the past. So I think that's an important uh, footnote to, to add to that point you made. Okay, well, and tied to that, obviously, is that an IRO not have management or relate to management operational responsibilities and its review of those, as well as then in doing an independent review of how the operational areas are operating. Yeah, the OIG focused in their GAGAS, uh, or the Generally Accepted Government Audit Standards, on the standards of independence and objectivity. The question is, is could you be the internal auditor at the same time be the IRO, or could you have other work that you do? And that got kind of blurred because um, uh, uh, I think that the accounting firms were using the, the Sarbanes-Oxley standards and, and not really thinking about what the OIG was looking for. So I think that's going to get some clarification in the future. Okay, now moving to uh, compliance monitors that we already uh, discussed. These are, are in some cases selected by the OIG uh, in a case involving either the appropriateness of care that's being provided, uh, admission to, let's say, hospice care, or quality of care cases. Um, in these cases, the OIG actually um, identifies the outside monitor, which is paid for by the organization to provide regular uh, clinical reviews and provide reports to the OIG on how the organization is doing. Uh, two CIAs, which are available on the OIG's website that specifically reference such compliance uh, monitors are the Extended Care and DaVita uh, CIAs, uh, which can be accessed very easily. Um, Dick? Well, we, we'll return back now to the compliance expert. <coughs> this is one of the things that is relatively new. It's only the last few years has been emerging and it's becoming a, a larger and larger issue uh, for the OIG. And what this means is the board must, is mandated to engage an independent compliance expert to assist them in meeting their compliance uh, oversight obligations. Uh, the compliance expert is required under the CIA to create a review work plan and then conduct a review. Then they must uh, prepare this, quote, compliance program review report. The board must review the report as part of their oversight of the compliance program. Then the entity must send that report to the OIG along with the annual report, along with the materials that have been provided to the board, plus minutes and meetings with the compliance experts that the OIG can have available for their review if they so want. <coughs> the the uh, selection process for uh, these independent experts, whether they be IROs or <coughs> compliance experts, is that the entity to make that decision. The OIG does not endorse any uh, com companies <coughs> or individuals. They reserve the right to deny approval. <coughs> the OIG has access to the IROs and their uh, C uh, compliance expert work papers and correspondence, and they have the right to review and question IROs and compliance expert work. 
The OIG also has the right to request the replacement of an IRO or a compliance expert if they find their work is compromised by uh, their in, uh, failure to have independence or conflict of interest or the quality of their work. Now, with respect to the IRO requirements, um, I, we referenced earlier what is euphemistically called the GAGA standards. And I draw your attention, these are available on the um, Government Accountability Office's website. Um, and the key areas that um, are referenced for purposes of any type of review organization, obviously GAG is focused on government-related reviews, but the similar standards are applicable to IROs, are independence and objectivity. Um, the OIG also requires that the organization have um, expertise in the particular federal health care program that um, is being reviewed, a knowledge of statistical sampling, because very often uh, the review is of a statistically valid sample of either claims or of arrangements. And as I mentioned, that it be independent with no conflicts of interest and objective. The switching of an IRO is an important thing. Remember, you, you're going to have about 90 days to do that. And, and set forth on the date uh, uh, from the date of the execution of the CIA. It, getting an IRO is not as easy as it sounds, and, and what we'd recommend uh, as a best practice is always when you toward a CI, start looking around to what kind of firm that you would want to engage to do this work. Now, these are for program reviews uh, primarily, and not for um, not for financial reviews. So you're talking about a firm that could be uh, either a uh, a law firm, accounting firm, or consulting firm. It really doesn't matter as long as they have the technical expertise to meet the obligations that exist in the uh, CIA. It's always a good practice to review uh, their CIA experience. The more engagements that they've had acting as an IRO, the, the more the better. With hundreds and hundreds now of CIAs, those firms that specialize in this area, that you could, you could look to expect to have as many as 10 or, or more engagements as a history that you can check on to make sure that they know how the process worked, and, and it really will make it not only for a more efficient operation, but it's more cost effective. And that means that looking at the number and type of reviews that these, uh, any uh, prospective firm that you're considering uh, may have conducted. Uh, you want to see what kind of the history they have in terms of how, what kind of a job they did, and kind of check their references with the people who, with whom they did that work. Um, the reason that bio less is important is that if the more experience they have, the better it is. If they don't have experience, they should not be learning how to do the job at your expense. So knowledge experience will re increase the efficiency and lower costs. And again, I say seek recommendations from others who have used uh, IROs to see if they, in fact, and compliance experts as well, to see if, in fact, they did a good job and how they worked out. Uh, selecting a positive track record uh, with the OIG is Im important because there always are issues under a corporate integrity agreement that need to be ironed out with the OIG. and and the better track record they have and the more credibility they have with the OIG, the easier it is to, to iron out some of these things that may have, um, uh, there's some of these ripples that may have to be ironed out. Also, it's very important, don't just go for the firm. Seek the identity and the credentials of the individuals who actually will conduct the review. Make that part of your agreement. This the idea of having a bait and switch where you have uh, top-notch people come in at the front end you get the engagement, then you see kids that are on the learning curve uh, that do the work. It's not a good practice, that's for sure. Again, IRO qualifications, expertise. That they, uh, they can do the program review, whatever kind of systems or transactions that need to be done. This not, these are not financial audits. As I mentioned, they could be any one of the uh, categories of consulting, audit, or law. This, it doesn't make any difference if they have the qualifications. Uh, sometimes the CA may require several types of reviews with different expertise. If it's possible, it would be good to have a firm that can do all of the requirements of an IRO rather than having multiple contracts. When you get multiple contracts, it tends to have some inefficiencies developed from that. It's not good. Yet, at times, you're probably going to have to consider that if the uh, work is really remarkably different in expertise requirements. Um, it must be able to, uh, that you, what we're going to use, especially now in light of this, this article that appeared uh, in, uh, in the media uh, about whether somebody can really be considered truly independent and objective, I would say going forward what you really must do is make sure that they will warrant to you 
said, they are meeting the independence and objectivity standards. They do not have conflict of interest, that they, in fact, are capable of doing the work, and they can do it objectively. They must do this. If you don't do that, you, you're asking for a potential problem down the road. And, of course, that Tom's already mentioned, they're following the, the GAGA standards of GAO is really uh, important. Um, and, uh, but again, I would say that warrant should be in the form of a certification that they will meet those requirements uh, called for by the OIG. Best practices. Did the firm meet, the, uh, meet its obligation of satisfaction when you're checking on them and the references? Were there any problems? Did the OIG find that the work was satisfactory? Did the firm perform the services economically and efficiently? Was the firm sensitive to the entity's operations and needs? Was the firm Firms work professional, competent, and timely. These are all the kind of things that would be worthwhile for you to find out from uh, your reference uh, checking. Okay, now I'd like to um, move to a discussion of a more recent phenomenon with respect to CIAs, uh, where the OIG tied uh, the adoption of a CIA to the Responsible Corporate Officer Doctrine. Uh, the Responsible Corporate Officer Doctrine actually emanates from a Supreme Court case way back in 1943. Um, sometimes it is referred to as the Park Doctrine relating to U.S. versus Park, which was a 1975 case. In that case, the Supreme Court basically said that a corporate officer, by reason of his or her position in the corporation and his or her responsibility and authority, had the ability to prevent or correct the violation. Therefore, that individual should be held responsible um, and appropriately uh, sanctioned, penalized, fined, whatever. More recently, the OIG has expressed support for its position under its exclusion authority against responsible corporate officers. It has indicated um, publicly a presumption in favor of exclusion when an executive knew or should have known of an improper corporate misconduct. I mean, you might might want to also talk about how that dovetails right into the H memorandum from the Department of Justice. Yeah, well, uh, in September of last year, uh, the Deputy Attorney General, uh, Sally Yates, issued what in the industry is called the Yates Memo, uh, which highlighted the fact that um, in the investigation and prosecution of cases, the Department of Justice would look to who was the, the ultimate responsible individuals when there were um, an investigation determined that there was fraud, waste, or abuse in, in a or fraud and abuse, I should say, in a, in a particular case. So um, guidance was given to federal prosecutors to be looking at um, the individuals and not just a corporation, and furthermore, not settling just with a corporation to the exclusion of individuals. Now, the OIG has used its exclusion authority against corporate officials in several cases, including the Purdue Pharma case and the Synthes cases. Um, those cases were appealed to the Department of Appeals Board, which upheld the exclusions, and the decisions are available on the OIG, no, I'm sorry, on the Department of Appeals Board website, which is part of the HHS website. Um, Moving forward here, uh, corporate uh, CIAs recently have required that each board member sign an annual resolution confirming the board's review and oversight of the compliance program and meeting the terms of the CIA. And a number of CIAs have incorporated that. Uh, moving to the next slide, this is just uh, the language that was taken just to show you an example, whereby the OIG expressly states the language for the resolution. The Board of Directors has made a reasonable inquiry into the operations of the compliance program, including the performance of the compliance officer and the compliance committee. And based on its inquiry and review, the Board has concluded that, to the best of its knowledge, the company has implemented an effective compliance program to meet federal health care program requirements and the obligations of the CIA. Um, underscore, who actually signs that certification? Well, that particular certification is required for members of the Board. So it's Think about that. All the members of the board got to got to sign this thing. They're certifying it, and it's under penalty of law. Now, moving uh, to management accountability and responsibility, in certain CIAs, the OIG has also required senior executives or managers to certify to their review of an operational issue, operational area, and meeting the terms of the CIA. And this is consistent with the corporate um, officer responsibility doctrine. Um, in other uh, situations, um, Dick, next slide, please. Okay, we got it here. Uh, CIAs have required either the CEO or the compliance officer to certify um, as part of the annual report to the OIG that all the CIA requirements have been met, and the report accurately reflects um, 
what has transpired. Um, and this slide shows the actual language which the, so, uh, which the OIG um, requires the certification to contain um, to be signed by um, either the corporate, uh, the CEO, or the compliance officer. Notice that this language is very, um, well, could be clearly actionable under 18 U.S.C. 1001, which is the criminal statute for false, fictitious, or fraudulent statements. And I think the OIG clearly was contemplating in getting these corporate these certifications that an individual would careful would be careful before they signed off on such a certification. Um, and then uh, finally, in some instances, the CIA may require that the um, cert that a certification be obtained from a particular employee who has assessed the appropriateness of certain operations and compliance issues. Um, and again, the language is there. And then our final certification is the CFO certification, where a uh, chief financial officer of a company uh, is required in certain cases under the CIA to certify to the statements as listed on this particular slide. So clearly certifications um, are a tool that the OIG has believed important in its enforcement and its monitoring and to ensure that there is compliance stand, uh, conduct moving forward. We recognize that we very quickly went through a lot of uh, content and that uh, uh, it's, it, it's hard to absorb all of it um, at one time. So let's, let's kind of re-view re, uh, uh, some of the key points that we think that's worth remembering. Um, first of all, you have to ensure that a compliance program has been implemented and can be evidenced when challenged by uh, the government. Uh, that uh, you're going to have to be Promptly, prompt in the in the finding and engaging of any mandated experts, and it depends on the time frame, but usually nine days up to 120 days, and that's for uh, it can be for the uh, IRO or uh, and or the compliance experts. You need to allow time to find and check the credentials of outside experts because if you pick the wrong, if you just pick somebody and it's the wrong it's the wrong firm or the wrong parties that are doing it. Uh, the last thing in the world you need to do is have another issue with the OIG that uh, complicates your relationship. Remember, the OIG expects that outside experts are going to be independent. They do not have conflict of interest, that they can, in fact, that they can do their job and that they can be credible in what they do because they are not impaired by any other considerations. Also, we think it's important to remember that the OIG relies on these reviews and reports of the experts. Uh, that uh, they will take them very, very seriously. So if the, if the IRO or the compliance expert finds problems, the OIG is going to take that very seriously and going to expect that there's going to be remediation very quickly and or to make a determination as whether additional action is needed on their part. The IROs and the, and the compliance experts themselves must have a, should have a credible, I really should say should, they should have a credible record. Um, uh, the more the merrier to show that they are professional in this area and they know what they're doing. They don't need to have people bumbling around or making mistakes. You're, the organization has already got to a CI because there have been mistakes and problems in the past. You don't need to aggravate it, but by having somebody bumbling along as your independent expert making additional heartaches for you. Experts need to have specific healthcare sector expertise. In other words, not only are they um, uh, experts in healthcare, but, but in a particular se sector. If it's disease management, they should know about disease management. If it's hospitals, they should know about hospitals. If it's hospitals, they should know about hospitals. If it's clinical labs, they should know about clinical labs. If it's DME, they should know about DME. Get the, the compliance sector expertise in there. That will save a lot of problems, especially where there are demands in the CIA for systems evaluation. Make sure, and I and I, I would say that actually, when you, and since everybody loves certifications, I would have any expert that you hire certify that they're free of any conflict of interest or any appearance of conflict of interest. Make sure that they, you don't engage somebody that, that has a history uh, with the entity that could be viewed as being uh, something that could compromise their independence uh, and objectivity. Make sure they're qualified. That's the people that they use are qualified for the reviews. And this goes back to what I said earlier, and that is one of the big problems you have is you have uh, people who really look like they know what they're doing coming in to close the deal and all of a sudden when the work starts they start having people who really are not as qualified and therefore you have a lot of problems and, and working out. But first of all, they take more time to do the work and secondly, the work is not as good as it should be. And a poorly prepared expert report may in fact 
trigger an OIG review or questioning. Remember, the worst thing in the world you could have is to have the OIG lose confidence in your expert and feel they have to come in behind them to find out what's going on that's uh, uh, to straighten it out. Certifying parties uh, with a, on the CIAs, um, uh, if you you will be relying upon your experts because when Tom was going over some of the certifications, like the board certifications, it's very clear that they the, that the OIG is saying that they are expecting that you are using these experts in such a way that you can rely upon what they are saying in order for you to make the certifications that you do. So keep that in mind. Also, Tom just mentioned, a false certification could result in a criminal prosecution under Title 18 United States Code Section 1001. Also, I should mention that in many of the CIAs, they will actually have a, um, a statement that says that a, uh, a false um, uh, certification uh, may, be a, may be considered a, a stipulated penalty of $50,000. So, I mean, this is uh, something that they take very, very seriously. Final thoughts. Expect your CIs to uh, continue to evolve and change. Uh, and, and actually, they're, they're, the, the telegraphing that or in the document that Tom had, had uh, uh, cited earlier where the OIG, along with others like the American Health Lawyers Association, that they will actually come out with what their current thinking is on where compliance programs should be going that eventually gets uh, picked up uh, in the CIAs. Uh, the CIAs uh, signal the OIG changing expectations and compliance programs as well. So that the CIAs themselves are a good place to look and say, well, this is what the, the OIG is mandating. Therefore, this is what their expectations are when they come in to see whether a program is, uh, is effective or not. The OIG white papers that Tom talked about telegraph all these new changes. General movement to more personal accountability of executives, compliance officers, and board is, in fact, continuing. Tom cited several different examples that shows that it's being reinforced back and forth between government agencies, not just the OIG, but CMS and Department of Justice, and it crosses over the board into other areas as well, and other agencies. So this is uh, something that you should keep in mind. It's also too important to increase supportable evidence of your compliance program. Uh, what this means is that, that people have trouble, they talk about output and think that it is everything effectiveness. Effectiveness is a factor of outcome, and that is how can you, can you evidence that your program is reducing the likelihood of having a problem that could create a liability. And then also remember that the Affordable Care Act it has a mandate in it for CMS to develop um, what would be, in fact, mandated rather than the voluntary standards that the OIG has for compliance program it will be mandated program guide and so forth. The only indication that they have of that has really appeared on the managed care site for all practical purposes. But what that means is that when CMS comes out with these mandated standards, that will be a condition of participation in Medicare and Medicaid, and they will probably have also a, 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 a certification statement of some sort coming from a CEO or from the board that they, in fact, are meeting, uh, that the organization that they represent are meeting those uh, standards. Dick, just tied to that certification, that's actually a phenomenon which is in New York, and the New York Medicaid Inspector General has required that healthcare entities in New York certify to the effectiveness of their compliance program. So that is a, sort of a trend uh, to tie um, an organization to certifying to a program's effectiveness. Well, also, you mentioned that the Omega uh, C, uh, IROs, the uh, Office of Medicaid Inspector General in uh, New York also uh, screens uh, their the IROs and actually uh, uh, engages in discourse with them before they approve them, um, and also mandates that they uh, evidence the fact that they meet the um, independence and objectivity as well as um, that they have the credentials to do the job. So that's probably something that might be the OIG will be considering. So at that point, we're at the end of our direct presentation, and, and when ready, we'll. Uh, address questions. Well, before we do that, I'm going to take just a few minutes to talk about uh, Walters Kluwer's ComplyTrack solution. We, I'll try and do it really fast so maybe we can get a question or two in. But the reason we want to highlight this is our issue and action management solution can be utilized within your organizations to support your compliance program, to capture the things that you're doing. Uh, if, unfortunately, an organization does end up under a corporate integrity agreement, being able to use the system to capture some of your responsibilities under that. So for example, the, what I have up on the screen 
one of the uses you can get out of issue and action management is capturing education. So if you're doing periodic education with your staff as part of your compliance program under a CIA, if you have to do uh, certain types or amounts of, of education, you can capture and manage that in the system. So I'm establishing that we need to do this education as part of our CIA. And then I can capture each time we conduct a session. I also would have the ability as I'm building in these activities that we're conducting to tie together all supporting documentation, your evidence. So a, a sign-in sheet, the PowerPoint you use, the agenda you use can be attached. Email reminders can be set up to ensure that you're accounting for all of the time frames that have to be managed. Security, making sure that only the appropriate individuals are coming into what you're capturing. But this is an enterprise-wide solution, so while we're focusing more on compliance at the moment, you can use it to capture issues and incidents that occur throughout your organization. You can use it to capture education and auditing that occur throughout your organization, when meetings are being held, when you get questions that you have to follow up on. All of these can be managed within the system. It's an incredibly customizable tool which is going to allow you to design the look of the screen to capture what you need to capture and report on as an organization. You can use it in risk management, human resources, IT, legal, internal audit, as expansively as you would like. And from a reporting perspective, we've built into issue and action management IBM Cognos reporting, which is going to allow you to work with pre-developed reports that we've created for you that you can simply come in and run but also has an ad hoc report writer capability that allows you to design your own report. So if you're reporting to a board or to a committee, that you can design the report to capture exactly what you need to be able to present to these different groups. It also has a front end incident management tool that allows you to create web forms that employees or others outside the organization can fill out and submit that can feed directly into issue and action management where you can then manage any follow-up that you're taking. So I do want to leave a minute or two for questions. So Beth, I, I apologize for going through that so quickly, but Beth, I will turn it back over to you to see if we can get through a couple of questions. Thank you, and we have lots of them. So I'm going to start this with saying we don't get time for your question. We will do our best to get back to everybody personally with your answer. So first and foremost, we have the same question asked in a variety of different ways. So Dick, um, here's the question. Who should a compliance officer report to? And when you answer that one, who should do the board training? And it could be the same, can it be the same training as the compliance gives to other people? Well, the OIG has been very, very clear about this and, and it's been restated a lot of different ways and, and uh, including in the CIAs and that is, the compliance officer should have um, direct access uh, and report to uh, the CEO and also uh, be able to report uh, to the oversight committee of the board. Um, what the OIG has said is that they are not comforted uh, at all to hear that the compliance officer goes through one of two areas that they feel compromises them. One is to report uh, to the CFO because quite frankly if they report through the CFO most of the problems that, that the OIG is concerned about would be problems that would be the responsibility of the CFO, and that's not good. And the other is that they are not comfortable when it goes through legal counsel, because legal counsel is sort of like the praetorian guard for the organization, and they're, that they have had a lot of adverse experience with um, uh, uh, the uh, legal counsel uh, putting things under privilege or avoiding uh, disclosure or somehow uh, shutting down uh, uh, direct access uh, or direct action by findings of the uh, compliance officer. So the best practice, direct access to the CEO, which means that they actually do can evidence it because because if, if if that's been said, uh, well, you have, yeah, it's the vice president reporting to the CEO. Well, okay, how often did the CEO meet with a person? What's the evidence they've done? The same thing is true with the board. Remember, in the CIEs, they're actually talking to the fact that, they, that the compliance officer not only has direct access to the board, but they should meet an executive session with, without management being present to be able to report truth, truthfully on what's going on. Okay, so we don't have a lot more time, but I love this question. Last week, Reuters published an article captioned, Independence of Compliant Reviews is Questioned by Drug Firm Settlements. It questioned the OIG's oversight of IROs, and focused on the situation whereby several large pharmas use their outside 
accounting firms to also serve as their IRO. It suggested there was a conflict of interest between the two roles. Can one firm serve in both capacities? What's your thoughts? Well, clearly it's fact specific. And again, it, you can make a unilateral statement that there is or is not a conflict. However, having said that, the fact that this has been identified as a potential problem under the GAGA standards where independence and objectivity are key, I think is going to signal the future whereby the OIG is going to potentially ask for certifications from IROs or for companies that seek to become an IRO that they are independent and objective. I think we're probably going to go further than that, Tom. I think probably uh, the OIG somewhere down the line is going to have uh, the IR, prospective IRO disclose any current or prior or future uh, negotiated relationship with the entity other than the IRO. So I think that uh, they're going to probably want to have more information to ensure that there isn't anything in there that could compromise their objectivity and independence. Okay, then. How can a company keep costs under control in meeting the terms of the CIA and the reviews conducted by an IRO? Well, let me just briefly say, number one, uh, once the CIA is entered into uh, an attorney or paralegal in the OIG counsel's office will be named as a monitor to work with the company in meeting the terms of the CIA. Um, and I strongly encourage close and regular communication with that individual. They. I have found want to work with a company to make a, a CIA work. Uh, there are um, almost always there's going to be ambiguities um, in some terms. And so one way to reduce cost is if there is something that is ambiguous or unclear, coordinate that, raise it with the monitor so you don't so that the organization doesn't go off on a track which is totally contrary to what the OIG expected. The opposite course, and of course you want to, if you want to make things more difficult for yourself and increase cost. Is, is the mistake that, that oftentimes happens where people are trying to relitigate the case that was settled with the Department of Justice with the OIG and who's trying to enter into a, a corporate integrity agreement. The OIG's position is those issues have been litigated and stop arguing. When you start arguing with the OIG about that, all of a sudden your ability to, to try to iron out differences becomes much more difficult. When, it, when you're selecting a, an IRO or, an in, or a compliance expert, you can save costs there if, in fact, if you get somebody with a track record and has got experience and is not on the learning curve where you're paying for the cost of their finding out how to do the job. So what standards must an IRO follow in doing their work? Well, Tom, Tom raised it in the, um, in, the, in the presentation, and that is that you really have to, and, the, and it's actually in the slides, and I'll, I'll refer back to that, but basically the generally accepted government audit standards by the General, General Accountability Officer, what, the OIG focuses on, the two standards are objectivity and independence. The third standard is also is that they are qualified to do the work. So I think that um, that you should look to that and the slides I think will, will give, give a better answer than for me to continue elaborating on it. One last question because I know we're over. I mean this is a doozy. What are the best practices in negotiating with the OIT the terms of a CIA? Well, I would start by saying that if uh, you have, if an organization has a compliance program in place, is educating the OIG to what it already, what safeguards do exist, and that subsequent to perhaps the risk area, what the company has done in the interim period. Um, likewise, I think it's important to educate the OIG on the particular type of business and try to have a CIA tailored to whether it be a hospice or a home health agency or a pharma company because obviously there are going to be differences in uh, federal, federal and state requirements for uh, co healthcare companies depending on their line of business. So I think it is critical to work with the negotiators to educate about the uniqueness of a company, what it has in place, uh, so that you're not in effect replicating or going off on a, in a different direction. Well, somewhere along the line also when you're under a CIA, uh, it, the, the, the uh, OIG will be happy to hear uh, from the compliance officer what's going on. The concern that they have is that sometimes the attorneys continue to act as an advocate and that, that taking that advocacy role sometimes um, rubs the wrong way. And there is nothing better uh, for an organization than to have uh, providing credible evidence that there's that the organization is taking serious um, note of, of meeting the obligation of the CIA and, and be able to evidence how they're doing that. And that is evidence of good work it will really go a long way 
to ironing out problems that might have been encountered while doing that good work. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you for everyone who stayed on through the questions. I know we're a little over. This has been recorded. Mary will be sending out, our marketing manager will be sending out the link. And we look forward to working with you all and showing you our next webinar. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Tom.